Welcome to the Industry Experts Panel at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. Today, we are welcoming to the show Mr. E.B. Tucker. He is one of the world's best financial commentators when it comes to precious metals, currencies, cryptos, and the worldwide markets. E.B. is the author of the new book, Why Gold? Why Now? And we're excited to have him here to talk about everything that influenced him and what he sees coming up in the future of our money. EB, welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm great. Thanks for having me. We are excited to have you here. And we want to start right off, of course, with precious metals. It's a very interesting topic right now, the ratio between silver and gold. It started off very low at about 123 to one, but that has been shrinking swiftly. We wanna talk about it also. Silver miners are seeing tremendous profits and gold miners as well. Warren Buffett has jumped into the mix. What do you see in all of this? Yeah, that's all, all true stuff that's very important. I mean, I talk about this stuff in the book I've got the book here is over my shoulder and, and people that have read it understand that the book is not about just, you know, some drumbeat for buying gold, you know, like, like some ideological thing. The book is subtitled the war against your wealth and how to win it. So what we're doing is we're saying like, you're in the money game, like it or not. I mean, if you're delivering pizzas, you know, and you're saving money and trying to better your life, you're in the money game. So it's time to wake up and pay attention. You have all these radical things happening that all involve your money. And um, <clears throat> this is the time to focus. So you talked about the gold silver ratio. I mean, for people, let's, let's just break this down really simple. Because we talk about it a lot, and I think we, we talk about it way too quickly, but you have an ounce of gold, it's about $1,950. And then you have an ounce of silver that, let me see what the price is of it right here, 2718. So the ratio between the two is about 72 right now. And what that means is you can buy 72 ounces of silver for the price of one ounce of gold. Now, people that are new to this fact, they might say like, well, what does that matter? I mean, I could compare, you know, the value of Audis to Chevrolets and just what is even the point of that? Well, in the earth's core, there's about 16 times as much silver as gold. Okay. So that's just from, if you, if you put the entire earth into a, into a mining processing machine, you would get about 16 times as much silver as gold. So, so historically, there's this argument for paying attention to this ratio. And okay, I'm not saying that this price of silver should be 16 to gold. There, there's always going to be a discrepancy. But in my book, I, I have a, a big section explaining this and say that the historical average back to 1990 is about 60 or 62 or something like that. We, we give the exact number in the book. And then we show that in March, that went to 123. That meant that one ounce of gold bought you 123 ounces of silver. Way too extreme. I think it actually went to 125 or something, but way too extreme. And so what that tells you is that silver in March was so cheap that it was half as cheap as its average price for the last 30 years. Now, what did, what did I do? I bought a, a bunch of, of, of derivative exposure to silver. What, what that means is I made a bunch of big bets that silver would rise by January and March and December. I mean, I, I put these things going out like 18 months to two years. And um, so far, that's worked out very well because silver went below 12. Now it's 27. I think it's going to go to 40 by the end of the year. 40 by the end of the year. I mean, let, let's maybe even as a headline, you can just to people really make sure they see that we said 40 bucks. Now, Absolutely. I mean, Absolutely. Wow. 40 bucks makes a lot of sense t- to me because I think gold to go to 2,500 and that gets us back to a ratio of about 62 and a half gold to silver, which is the average back to 1990. So all we're talking about is, is going back to the average. So I hope for people that gives them a kind of a full, view because everybody talks about that ratio and i think it's it's too bad because people say well what does that even mean they don't know what it even means so so if you really want more in the book there's a big there's a section that explains it in terms that you could you know you can explain it to your housekeeper and she would understand so i mean so so it's important to know these things why they're the way they are everybody wants the answer like i wrote newsletters for 10 years or something and it was really sad because people would 
we would work for weeks on the newsletter and we would see that they would open the newsletter and immediately scroll to the bottom to get the stock pick. And it's like, look, man, why don't you want to know how we got the stock pick? Because if you, if you read enough issues of how we got the stock pick, you don't even need me anymore. <laughs> so like you basically, you, you have like an MBA and, you know, and, and you don't even need the author anymore because you become the author. So, I mean, you know, understanding how these things work is very, very helpful if you, if you want to get on top of your money situation. I mean, you know, you, you're not going to be able to find some secret answer all the time and somebody's got a crystal ball. There is no crystal ball. Forget about it. You know, the, the guys that make a fortune are the people that understand how to look around at the grass. You know, when, when the wind is blowing, you see the grass bent over, you know which way the wind's blowing. So this is the people that make a fortune in the market. It's all they need to see is the grass. They don't need someone to tell them which way the wind's blowing. They, can, they know when they see that grass. That's what happens over years of this stuff is you're getting all these clues and you start becoming very comfortable that all the clues mean something and then you don't mind placing big bets. And believe me, it's a lot more fun to, to have success with your money than it is to be constantly licking your wounds and having to go out and toil away at some job, you know, and save up a bunch of after-tax money and go get fleeced again. I mean, that's just no way to live. Right, right. Now, you mentioned your book a couple times, and it's fascinating. It's got all of this stuff in it, plus the background of your relationship with your grandfather. It's, it's an extraordinary um, read, and I want you to go into it a little bit for our audience, please. It's um, Why Gold? Why Now? Yeah, so, so my sister jokes about it because, she, see, what happened was <clears throat> she, she – um, I had this process. I wrote the whole book in three weeks, 23 days. And I had a process where every single day I wrote 2000 words or more and sent it to my sister to, to read, to see if you know, it was coherent and then it would come back and edit it and then send it to the editors, whatever. And my sister always jokes about it. She says, it's not why gold, why in a few years, <laughs> it's why gold, why now, you know, it's it, now is the time. This is the year, you know, this is the time to, to understand this stuff. So, so look, the format of the book is, the beginning of the book is a story is, is my story. And the reason why I'd make it very clear, the reason why I tell you the story is not to just hear myself talk. It's because I want to earn your time. I want, I want, I want you to be able to say, why am I going to invest the time to read this guy's book? Well, I tell you in the introduction, this is how it all happened. This is how I got into this, you know, decade and a half ago or something. And, and then I had a background prior and my grandfather taught me about stocks and, and he was a, on the board of a bank and, you know, it was, it was a very influential person in my life. And I learned about stocks when I was kind of a rowdy teenager. I mean, he, what he did is he told me that I always liked working and he said, listen, how about the concept of you can own a company and never go to work there? Now, when I was like 15, I said, no, wait a second, you mean you can get paid and you don't even have to show up at the company? He goes, that's right. So, I mean, this was how he, he was, you know, teaching me uh, base, the basics, you know, when I was growing up. And I developed just a really, a really um, a strong passion for, for stocks. I mean, specifically just, just common stocks. I mean, I was, you know, 19, 20 years old, saving my money, buying stocks. And, you know, it was like, this is a long time ago. This is in the late nineties, you know? So, I mean, it was a different, it, things were a bit different. It was a tech boom, you know, and I'm watching all this happen, you know, as, as a beginner investor. And um, anyway, I, t I tell you not too much detail, but how all this happened and how I got here. And a lot of people are interested you know, I wrote a lot of the major newsletters, Stansberry, Bonner, uh, Casey, you know, I wrote all these newsletters and then on my own as well. And, and I just retired from that actually earlier this year. You know, I did that for a long, long time. So if you ever subscribe to a newsletter, you know, chances are I wrote it. And um, I tell people how that business works and, you know, what you're, you know, give you a look behind the curtain there. And I think all that is, is of interest. But look, we do all that so that we can lay the groundwork to say, okay, why gold? Why now? I mean, what's going on now? I mean, the book had to be written in 23 days because what happened in March was a radical change in what's ahead for us. Now, if you had asked me in January, what's going to happen with gold, you know, I'd been publicly predicting it would break the old $1,900 high this year, which, which we've done that already. But 
what's changed is I saw trillions and trillions of dollars almost overnight flooding into the money system. And I just thought this is wild because back when we did the, the housing crisis bailout, the TARP bailout, that was like 700 billion. And it was, it was nightly news for, you know, three weeks with people arguing about 700 billion. Are we going to ever make it back from the precipice? I mean, this was like 3 trillion in the U S I mean, then all the other countries as well. And, and for what, for what? I mean, it's, 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 it, you just throwing money at these problems that will never be paid back that nobody knows where the money goes. There's all these stories of fraud. I mean, we saw all this coming is paying people not to work. I talk about all this in the book, paying people not to work. This is universal basic income, you know, uh, modern monetary theory. It doesn't matter what the interest rate is because you're never going to pay the money back. People have got to see this right now because you go to work every day and you earn dollars, you know, or whatever you're, wherever you live and you're watching this. I mean, and you save that money and you, why do you do that? Well, someday you hope to not work. I mean, I mean, I don't, I don't know anyone that says, I hope in my eighties that I'm, you know, loading trucks at the home Depot or something. I don't know anyone that says that. I mean, the, the, the ultimate goal is that, is that you can get yourself to a place of stability that you can enjoy your family and your time and hobbies and, you know, enjoy your life a bit because this life goes by boom like that it's over. And, and it's very quick. And it doesn't mean that, that you shouldn't enjoy working, enjoy all these things. But um, I don't know anyone that says there's no purpose to it other than to show up every day and, you know, load stack boxes in a warehouse. I mean, this is ridiculous. So, I mean, you're doing it, you're trying to advance. And, and uh, that was my story. You know, I mean, I spent years delivering pizzas and doing electrical work and construction. And I mean, it was for a purpose. I mean, I was trying to get into, get into college, go to college. And after college, I was doing jobs I didn't really want to do so that I could do the jobs that I did want to do. I mean, it's everybody's on this journey, this path and um, the, the path. Okay. You ever see a sign that says bridge out ahead. Okay. That's the path you're on right now. Okay. <laughs> this bridge is out ahead <laughs> plus boulders thing. plus, you know, shoulder is out plus, you know, fog hairpin curve. plus <laughs> hairpin curve, right. Plus brakes are out. I mean, like, you know, this is the situation now. The good news is you're not totally doomed. It is possible to navigate and it doesn't have to be graceful. The thing you got to understand is that you don't have to come out of a radical time with a big success. You just have to be the second slowest camper running away from the campsite when the bear gets hungry. Right. Okay. So, 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 somebody's going to get mauled. It doesn't have to be you. So like in the depression era, we talk about if you stored your wealth in gold, what happened? You didn't make a fortune. It wasn't like you came out of that, you know, with servants and, you know, uh, no, forget about it. But you preserved your wealth, you preserved your wealth. And then you were able to turn that wealth into opportunity as things picked back up. Whereas a lot of your peers were stuck. And they were, they took years to dig out of that hole. Okay. So, so we paint this picture for you. I mean, you, 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 I wrote the book so that the most basic person could understand it. The most, the, the, it's my peers have read the book. I've sold 11,000 copies of the book, which by the way, in book world is a lot of copies of the book. And so I've gotten a lot of feedback. I've had a lot of people contacting me on LinkedIn and all these things and reviews, whatever. The purpose is to give people this message that we're talking about now. This is, this is the purpose. This is, it's now. And this is the time to have that message because everybody knows something's wrong, but not many people know what to do about it. Right. And I think that's the key. The time is now. The time isn't, well, in a couple of years from now, I plan to. No. Why gold? Why now? Um, you made some really good points. Um, number one, it's interesting, and, and this seems to be something that I don't hear many people asking, but EB, we know that trillions and trillions of dollars have been printed recently over the past year, let's say. Where does it go? 
we don't see this as Americans. We should have money floating from the sky. I mean, there should be money everywhere with all of this printing that's going on. Now, obviously, it's digital. I'm well aware of that. So we're not going to have dollar bills floating everywhere. But everyone should be flush with cash. That's not happening. We're not seeing that at all. Um, secondly, when they go to the universal income, which, which we're headed that direction, obviously, what is going to be the incentive to work? I mean, the changes that are happening right now, what's going to be the incentive to go out and drive that truck when it's snowing outside to get that delivery to those grocery stores? What's going to be the incentive to do the things that maintain our life that we've built over the past, what, century we've built a great society in which you go to the grocery store it's stocked you get whatever you want your deodorants you have seven different brands to pick from you know we don't appreciate the society that we've built we have the attitude of destroying it right now even but the universal income from my point of view could be maybe i'm wrong but it could be um, very disincentivizing to many, many folks that make our lives go, right? That's right. Um, let, let, me, let me share with you something that might make you uncomfortable. Um, the goal from the top, the, 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 the planners of the society, the Politburo, the people in control, they want to give you just enough money so that you don't revolt. You understand what I'm saying by this? Like you notice how you have 3 trillion that gets pumped immediately and people get an extra unemployment benefit for a month or two. It's just enough money so that you decide to put down the rocks and I would say guns, but nowadays the guns, you can't even almost have a gun comfortably anymore because you're, you're deemed to be a terrorist or something. So effectively nowadays you revolt with rocks and poster board and stuff. So, I mean, make, you make posters protesting. Okay. Just enough money for you to put that stuff down and go home and turn on Netflix and take some antidepressants that you can get from the Medicaid, you know, card and, get yourself a nice bag of processed potato chips or something and sit down on the couch and veg out for the rest of the day watching propaganda films. Okay. So you need to understand trillions, trillions, trillions. Okay. Yeah. It's not ever going to end up in your pocket. What's going to happen is most of that money, the, the lion's share of that money is going to go to keep the debt based system inflated at the end of last year, there was about $255 trillion worth of debt in the world. I don't know how big that number is going to be at the end of this year, but I can assure you it's going to be bigger than it was last year. When you have a system that's that big, you have to keep it growing slowly. 1%, 2% a year, something like that. Because if it gets smaller, what happens is, is that people can't, companies, businesses, financial firms, governments, whatever, they can't refinance that debt comfortably. So the, when this begins shrinking, you create this feedback loop and essentially the system crumbles. And then it's like Warren Buffett would say about when the tide goes out, you, you see who was, had no swim trunks, okay? So every time you see these bailouts, every single time you see them, a tiny portion is going to end up in your pocket. I mean, the average person that makes 60 grand a year got a $1,200 check and they took that money and put it in a Robinhood account and started buying options. I mean, okay. So <laughs> there's your, there's your reward. Okay. I, I hate to tell you, but I got nothing. And the people that I hang with, they got nothing. Okay. We just pay more and everything is slowed down and you can't, get your tax return back because it's COVID and you can't get, you know, your, everything is, is, is because of that. Right. So there's, so there's all these excuses and nothing works, nothing happens. Okay. We don't to get into that, but the point is to, to, okay. People need to understand all these trillions of dollars go to keep this giant 
credit system intact. That's the whole point of it. And there's going to be another bailout and another bailout and, and negative interest rates. All this stuff is coming. I mean, you, you, you think what's happened now is crazy. We're just getting started. Negative interest rates. We have a whole chapter on this in the book. Negative interest rates are very important. It's a very important tool for the Federal Reserve because the Federal Reserve has lost the power to stimulate the economy through monetary policy. Remember, the first time they put rates at zero, you had a housing boom and all these things happen. But now you put rates at zero, nothing happens or very little happens, okay? So when you go negative interest rates, what happens is the bank is now charging you to keep money there. So what are you going to do? You're going to pull the money out. And what are you going to do with the money? You're going to do something with it. You're going to put it in the stock market. You're going to, you're going to buy a bond. You're going to buy a rental house. You're going to go on a cruise. Whatever you do, you're stimulating the economy. You know, the, the, during the crisis this year, those four and a half trillion went into money funds. Okay. Imagine that four and a half trillion. If you suck that out and people spent that at malls and, you know, theme parks and, and vacation spots and airlines. I mean, imagine what would happen. You know, it would be a, a major, a tsunami of economic activity. And so uh, that's how we explain how negative interest rates work and why they're important. It's going to happen. Universal basic income. There's a, there's a hilarious book about universal basic income. We, we do a quick review of it in my book. It's very, very funny. And, and the whole attitude of it is, is that by paying people a basic wage, then they can do whatever job they want to do instead of the job they have to do. And, and I don't know anyone other than when, when I was five years old, I wanted to be a trash man. That was what I thought was the coolest job in the world. But I don't know anyone that says, I'm, I'm just dying to pick up trash, you know, and, and build sidewalks in the hot sun and, and um, you know, do, do – uh, underwater welding repair for bridges. And I mean, who wants to do all this stuff? Uh, it just doesn't make any sense. I mean, there's, there's, like you say, I mean, there's, there's no, you gotta, you gotta enjoy and see a reward. So you're going to take away the reward. Well, it gets back to my original point is that this stuff is not meant for you to be happy. It's meant to be just barely enough to keep you from revolting. That's the goal of all these things. So that's what's ahead. There's more of that coming by the way. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I want to ask you something about the tech stocks, um, the stocks at the top at the moment. Do you see them as being in a bubble that could suddenly pop? I, the thing is, people need to see that, that most, the majority of stocks are down. <clears throat> it's Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, Google, Netflix, you know, just a handful of stocks that now have market cap larger than most countries, the value of, you know, the whole GDP of most countries. And I don't really see this as a market pop situation. I see this as a dead money situation, as an investment that becomes, it grinds, it, it, it looks like it's maybe a little up, maybe a little down, a little up, a little down, it goes nowhere. And you look back in a couple of years and you say it went nowhere. It went nowhere. These companies are not going away. They're not, you know, some kind of like accounting fraud. I mean, these are big, big, big companies. I mean, I, I just downloaded the new Apple um, update on my phone and it has this, uh, this new feature that, that tracks wherever you go. Okay. And every other phone that you come in contact with, with a, a signal goes between those phones. And then if one of those people gets a virus and puts the information into the phone, it notifies health authorities of every other phone that they were near for like a two week period. You could turn this off, by the way, you go to the settings and you can go in there and you can, you can, you can turn this off and you look at this and you just think, I mean, this company's not going anywhere. <laughs> it's like, there's, there's no, I mean, this thing is not a bubble, you know, it's not, but, just because it's on a bubble doesn't make it a great investment. I mean, Apple at $2 trillion market cap, it's like, look, I mean, what are you going to do? 4 trillion? I mean, 6 trillion is, is a third of the whole economy is a telephone company. I mean, maybe, but I don't know. I mean, I, I, I bought some Campbell's soup stock, which did fantastic during the pandemic. 
it's very, it's very boring and stupid. I mean, they make soup in a can and they make snacks and, and pretzels and stuff like that. And they pay a nice dividend. I don't know what it is now, three and a half, four and a half percent or something. I mean, it was during the pandemic, you could get it like 5% and the stock has done great. I mean, it's, it's, it's up a little bit this year. And, and the reason I call it a stupid company is because 50 years ago, you would, you would have loved to own this company. I mean, they make soup and they make money doing it. <laughs> and then they, you know, what they, you know what else they do? They give you some of that money back. They mail you a dividend check. And um, I went to the company's annual meeting in 2000 and uh, I think it was 19 um, and met some people on the board and all this stuff. But my point is, is that, is that there's companies out there that make money and they're not popular and they're not part of these algorithmic giant ETFs that everybody funnels their 401k money into. And you can buy these companies and largely sit on the sidelines. I mean, because, because think about it, if you could find a company that makes a profit making a can of soup and you can, it goes up with dividends included, you know, 10, 12% a year and the rate of return is 0%. But what, what, what else are you trying to do? I mean, what, 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 what were your goals? Like Metalla, Metalla Royalty. So Metalla is, is gone up like 90% a year for four years and people complain about it. And, and I asked him, okay, what were your expectations? Just, just so I know, what were the other investments that you feel like you could have been involved in that were superior? Because I mean, you're dreaming to think that you can consistently find, you know, triple digit returns for years and years and years and years. I mean, someone is, is definitely scamming you if they're like, you can, you can, you know, and I'm talking about Metalla going backwards, by the way, I'm not talking about going forwards. I'm, I'm not, I'm not making you any promise. Okay. I'm, I'm making a reverse looking statement. Okay. This is already this is 2016, uh, November, we, we started trading under Metalla and this has been almost four years ago. So it's a dollar 20 Canadian then, and it's something like, uh, 1085 now. Okay. So, so, you know, plus dividends. So you do, you, this has already happened, but my point is people complain about that. And I'm thinking, what, 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 what are you, what are you, what are you thinking? I mean, this is not the way it works. I mean, how do you build wealth? You spend less than you, than you earn. Okay. And you invest the difference wisely because because if you if you invest in a scam and the money is gone you start over you can't do that so anyway the, the the point is all this stuff is happening okay so it's like wake up you know maybe you've been asleep this is what's going on in the world and it's time to pay attention eb what is um metalla's what are the tickers to metalla royalty yeah, it's MTA. So, so MTA uh, in the U.S. and MTA in Canada. That's Michael Tango Alpha MTA. So it's that in Canada on the TSX Venture. It's that in the New York Stock Exchange. It's not like some pink sheet stock. I mean, this is you know we we, we listed on the New York Stock Exchange, Amex uh, uh, in the U.S. Just, there's tons of volume and Metalla buys royalties. Okay, so in the book I talk about what a gold royalty is. Now you have physical ounces of gold. Okay, then you have gold mining stocks which are very dangerous. We talk about those in the book. I mean, I've been in that business a long time and you know, I wouldn't feel comfortable if my, uh, my, you know, sister or cousins or something was investing in lots of gold exploration companies. And was, I'd, I'd have warnings for them. Okay. They're not, not a stay away zone, but they're dangerous. And then, and then you have royalty companies. Now royalty is, is a perpetual non-dilutable economic interest a carried interest in the mining property. What that means is you have a big piece of land in Nevada or something, big square, and the company is digging, digging, digging for gold there. Metalla has 1% or 2% or whatever the case may be of every single ounce that ever comes out of that ground is belongs to Metalla. That means forever and ever and ever. Even if that company runs out of money and has to issue a billion shares of stock to try to stay in business and dig a hole and produce the stuff. And it's really hard and there's a collapse and six people die. And there's a, you know, native American revolt on the reservation next door and they stop the mining rights. I mean, you name it, it doesn't matter. 1% forever on that property period. So that's a royalty. It's, it's the closest thing I've ever seen to having a tax. And so I explain in this book 
at the end of the book, how you, how you get these things. Like it's very easy to understand because somebody finds the, the initial deposit and usually creates a royalty and then sells it to a mining company. And then eventually that person gets very old. And then you say, wouldn't you like to sell that royalty to Metalla? And, um, you know, you can have stock in Metalla and we have 50 royalties and that's how we bought them all. And so, um, so anyway, so, so, but I've got something more exciting to tell you. So that's done very well. Okay. And it's, and, and, and I'm very optimistic about the company. I'm, I'm on the board. I'm a major shareholder. I've bought lots of stock. You can look up the insider reports, just pages and pages of me in there. I'm very, I'm very positive about my team, my board members. I'm very happy there. Okay. But through the course of building that company, we have found other royalties on other things that, that we only do gold and silver because if you get distracted, you know, it diminishes the value of the, of the company. Okay. Cause you have people, you know, you can't have some iron ore and some, all this other stuff, you know? So we had a guy come to us a few years ago and he said, I got this, this royalty on a nickel mine. Okay. Nickel deposit. It's really big. And so we, we know about nickel because nickel is a, it's the critical component in electric vehicle batteries the critical component and people think it's lithium wrong cobalt wrong it's nickel that is the there's a the net this generation of batteries that we're using right now it's eight parts nickel so eight out of ten by the way okay so so nickel is the critical component it's very hard to find the nickel there's not a lot of nickel mines there's not not all nickel is the same i don't want to get into it but it's very complicated so we told this guy listen we can't take that. So, but we, we could do something, you know, with it. And we started a, another company, which will come public around October 1st called Nova royalty and <clears throat> Nova meaning new, you know, or next or whatever, however you want to translate and Nova royalty uh, will trade in Canada under N O V R will be the ticker symbol. And Nova royalty is nickel and copper royalties, which nickel and copper are the critical components of the next generation of energy. And I want you to think about this, like when, when you first discovered hydrocarbon energy, you know, and people, people originally used oil for it's just lamp oil, right? I mean, it was like coming out of seeping out of the rocks in Pennsylvania. I mean, it was, it was like, they didn't know what to do with it. Okay. But slowly as you, as you start to develop an industry around this, um, what happens is, is that, you know, there's other things that get involved like um, roads. Okay tires. I mean, you have all these things that go, well, nickel and copper are absolutely the fabric of the next generation of energy. BP said the other day that we reached the peak of hydrocarbon energy. That this is the peak that the demand for hydrocarbon energy will not materially grow. doesn't mean it's going to go to zero, but I'm saying that it's not expanding. It's not going to expand. And I'm telling you that, that you will not see mass production of, of hydrocarbon based, uh, cars, you know, vehicles, okay. Hydrocarbon powered, you know, like, like gas, you know, even natural gas, you know, anything that's just an oil derivative, you will not see that in the future. And the reason why is because all the governments, all the car manufacturers, all the society, the major societies of the world are demanding, um, uh, a, a solution. Okay. So like, I don't know one car company that says by 2050, we'll be producing all gasoline and diesel cars, but all the car companies have targets for EV vehicle production. Okay. As this is coming and you cannot make these cars without nickel. You can't do it. It's impossible. I know this now, maybe years from now, there's a new battery technology. Maybe, Maybe there's a hydrogen technology. I don't know. But I can tell you that there's billions of dollars invested in making the batteries right now for these for the next few years for these cars. And you can't do that without nickel. So we have a company coming for that. It's going to be really exciting. And there's going to be an, an opportunity for people to learn about that when it happens, when it comes out, when it trades, the same way we were telling people about Metalla in 2016, they didn't listen. They said, yeah, this is ridiculous. I'll buy some Facebook or something. But, but basically, this is coming now. It's very interesting in the company's Nova Royalty. You can Google it now and see the, the presentation and the stock will trade at the beginning of October sometime once the exchange gives final approval. But, but my point is the royalty business 
is where I have my money. I, I love the royalty business. The mining business is risky. It's dangerous. It's complicated. The royalty business is, is the lazy man's way to ride the wave because you have so much more stability in that business. And again, I walk through all this in the book. I tell you exactly how I think about investing my own money. And, um, and I hope people read that and learn. It's not like a secret ticker symbol in there, but I tell you my thought process. And if you take the time to read it, you don't need me anymore. You, you, you'll become the guru yourself. Now repeat Nova for us again. Now is it, is the company actually N O V A? Yeah. Nova royalty. Yeah. Okay. Nova That's royalty. Good. I mean, if you Google search Nova royalty, nickel, you know, it'll come right up and, um, and you can see the presentation. There's a website. You know, there's a new, you sign up for news releases. And uh, look, it's, it's, it's the same people behind Metalla. You know, it's Brett Heath, myself, a lot of the core shareholders, you know, Adrian Day, Peter Schiff, um, you know, the, the BD family in Canada. All these people are, are the backers of Metalla. And, and all you have to do is look back at Metalla and see what we've been – you can pull up interviews for me from four years ago. I mean, I wasn't saying Mattel is going to be successful. What I was saying is Mattel is aiming to buy royalties and this is how they're aiming to do it. Right. And, and then we just did it. It wasn't, it wasn't like we were saying, we didn't know exactly how it would work out, but we, we knew what we were trying to do. And um, that's the same thing with Nova. I mean, the, and the reason why Nova and Mattel aren't together is because you can't take gold and silver royalties and then take, copper and nickel royalties and put them all together because base metal royalties and precious metal royalties have different valuations and you need different teams to go after them. And you just, you, you, you just can't, you know, you, you, you can't achieve the same superior economics with these companies together. You can't do it. And so for example, if we were going to buy, you know, some other kind of royalty or something, we, we would put it in a different company because you want that to have its own unique structure and trading pattern and management and, you know, focus. The key is to focus. I mean, no one person can say, I'm just going to buy all this different stuff. You know, I'm just going to do all that. And I'm, when I get done with the copper royalty, I'll then do, a, do a silver royalty. And I mean, it's like, it's like, you could do it, but it takes a long time. It takes a really long time. These things aren't listed on Zillow or something. It's not like that. I mean, you, you know, it takes years to, to infiltrate these markets and buy these things. And so we, we have a unique team. You know, Brett and I are behind the company and, and very supportive, but we have a unique team that's working day in, day out to buy these copper and nickel royalties the same way we have at Metalla, a day-to-day team that's focused on gold and silver. And so you can study that focus. I recommend doing that you know, anytime, because this is something that people, I'm actually, I'm about to give a talk in the next few days to a, to an MBA class at a college. And the professor read the book and asked what I explained the royalty business to the finance, uh, the people going for their finance MBA. You know, so, so my point is, is that, is that, you know, this is a good thing to understand, you know, regardless of what your take is on getting involved but it's, it's good to understand this because you can see something that is a part of the market that's not widely known. And maybe someday it will be. And that's that when something is then widely known, I think you, you, you should be less excited about it. Right. That's incredible. Just the list of names you listed right there behind you, um, behind your company are the Titans within the mining and the exploration of, uh, both precious and base metals and many people um, understand the precious metals industry, but they don't, they really don't understand the base metals, which you just listed the copper and the Mm -hmm. nickel and how absolutely essential they are to the whole green energy movement. The, um, the electric cars that are coming out from, you know, not even that. I mean, there are going to be electric cars, which are, um, uh, I guess you'd call them, you know, self-powering, they repower themselves, they generate the energy for their battery by the roads that will be implemented. And a lot of that has to do with copper itself also. So you can- Well, copper is the, copper is the, is the artery system. You know, think of it like the veins in your, your body. I mean, copper is how it all travels. I mean, so you have like a hundred pounds of copper in, in a, in an electric vehicle, you know, cause it's all connected, you know, and then the nickel is the, 
is the, the key element for the actual storage of the energy. You know, so you think nickel, you know, is you can't store that energy without nickel and then you can't transmit it without the copper and all this radical technology you're talking about, you know, it, it all rides on that, on those metals. And, and so again, maybe ages from now, there's a new technology. Like we talked to the guy that invented the lithium uh, ion battery. He's a old guy. He's a professor at, at uh, Texas, you know, it's very, very old now. And in fact, you know, it's, I'm not sure if he's even working anymore. Okay. But, but we talked to this guy and he said, listen, you can make batteries out of anything. I mean, you can make them out of sand. You can, cause anything that will create a chemical reaction to store energy. You know, he said, there's all these different, you know, batteries like that we have played with, you know, we've tried to make them. And was, but the, but the problem is, is that some of them don't hold up in hot weather. Some of them don't hold up in cold weather. Some of them get really hot and explode. You know I mean? It's all these different problems. And so for, for us today, you know, for, for our life now, the nickel based battery, okay. With its primary components, nickel is the most practical battery. And that's why you've seen billions and billions and billions from Tesla and, and Volkswagen and all these companies go into creating the component system for making these batteries, you know, and that's why Elon Musk is saying, I've got to have access to nickel. You know, he's in, out cutting deals with mining companies now because he realizes like we do that there's not enough nickel. So you got to go right to the source. There's, there's going to be more of that. And see, that's, that's what, you know, that's when you know something's happening and that's when you need to take action now and not in the future. Incredibly exciting when self-charging batteries come on the market too, with the roadways and everything. This is just the future is about to change in such a massive way. Most people don't realize it. And this company that you just mentioned, I'm very excited <clears throat> about Nova. Um, I want to ask you something, Evie, from your perspective, you are really good at um, predicting things and in the political arena right now, um, the race for the president what are your thoughts about what's going to happen after the election? Do you believe either party is going to be able to accept the results? What's your gut instinct about what's going to happen? Well, so in 2015, I think, I went to uh, Calgary and Edmonton and Fort McMurray and all over oil country. Maybe, maybe it was 16. I can't, I can't really remember exactly now. But here's what I want to tell you, is that they had this conservative government, and then it, then it flipped to what's called NDP, um, which was a, a, a left-wing government. <clears throat> and so Doug Casey and I were working together, and we, we took a big road trip up there together, just the two of us. It was really fun. And we, we asked, we would go to lunch, you know, somewhere, whatever, and we would ask the server or the, you know, the manager, everyone, would you mind, we'll give you like a two loony coin, you know, like two, $2, right? If you answer some questions for us. And they were always like, oh, this is, okay, sure. Did you vote for the NDP? No, 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 no. Everybody said, no, 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 no. We couldn't find one person that vote, voted for NDP. But NDP won. And so nobody, so what we concluded was that everybody was too embarrassed Line. to say that, yeah, <laughs> so that nobody would tell you what they were doing, right? So, so it was fascinating. I mean, we wrote newsletters about this. I mean, we, 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 we said people are just ashamed to tell you who they voted for. So all I know is that, is that the, the, the media in the U.S. is, is, is rabid, okay? Now, I don't vote, okay? I haven't voted since Bush Jr. was, was running. Now, and I don't have a television at my house. You know, this is my office, obviously, no television, but in my house, no television. I just have art. I have art and rugs, and we chill out there, and there's nothing, you know, we tell stories and stuff like that. There's no there's no um, media coming in. Okay. It's not because I have some problem with the media. It's just because like, I, I don't want to hear it. You know, I don't, I don't want to hear anything about it. I don't have any preferences. I don't care. Okay. And people say, well, you should care because you're smart. No, no, no. I don't have to care if I don't want to care. Okay. So, 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 but this is the thing. 
if the if the left wing media and the left wing would hire me as an advisor, what I would tell them is I would say, listen, you got to stop. You got to stop attacking Trump because the more you attack something, the stronger it gets. Have you ever met someone that can't stop talking about their ex, like their ex-husband or something or ex-wife? They just can't stop. The first thing that goes through your mind is, God, I kind of like to meet this person. <laughs> it's like you can't, you can't, people won't shut up about him. You know, they just say, oh, they're terrible. You can't get him out she's of their terrible. mind. There must she's be something. She's terrible. Yeah, you, you, she's <laughs> awful. She's just, okay, you, the first thing you start thinking is, oh, well, this sounds kind of exciting. I mean, you know, I, 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 I'm curious about this person now, okay? You, you talk about them incessantly. So when you suppress something, it gets stronger. If you have a, a vice and you suppress this vice, it actually gets stronger. When you expose the vice to real life, it actually gets weaker because it's no longer this like uh, thing that you're trying to keep like Ghostbusters were always keeping the ghost in that container and they would never stay in there. They keep slipping out, you know, when you're least expected. <laughs> so my point is, is that I would advise the media, stop bashing this guy. If you want to beat Trump, stop putting on the front page of the newspaper for Memorial Day all the names of people that have died from COVID-19 and saying that this Memorial Day for people that Trump has murdered. I mean, stop saying that stuff. You know, this is New York Times. I don't know if you remember this. The whole front page was all little tiny names, like a, like a war memorial, but it was people that died from COVID. Okay. And then a I couple months ago, that. That's yeah, it's, just, it's insane. So it's insane. So my point is I would tell them just don't cover the guy at all. If you want to beat Trump, don't cover him at all. Just let Pete, let him do his thing and let the chips fall where they may. That's how you beat someone. Like go back to the X thing. How do you beat your ex? I'll tell, it's very easy. Don't say anything. They say, oh, it didn't work out. It's fine. You know, it's very nice. I mean, that's how you get, that's how you get over something, anything in life. Okay. But what's happening, go, go into an airport. I mean, I have been into an airport since the COVID thing started to, yeah, I, I did fly. It was bizarre, but every single television, it's all, every single television, it's all Trump. Go to a, go to a drugstore where they have, you know, magazines and newspapers, every single cover is all Trump. Okay. So my point is, is that to answer your question, I don't know what's going to happen, but I can tell you that my suspicion is that a lot more people are going to vote for Trump than will admit it because they're embarrassed. Okay. I think that for sure. And the second thing is, I think that the more radical the mainstream message becomes, the stronger it makes Trump. And so if they want to, if they want to beat this guy, they, they have to, they have to stop doing that. And I don't think they will. So as to what happens, I don't know. I mean, you really, you see Zuckerberg coming out on a Facebook video and saying that, that people are going to have trouble accepting. How does he know that? Okay. Well, clearly he's delivering a certain message and the messaging is that people are going to revolt if they get the wrong outcome. You notice the hypocrisy, by the way, it's like people that say that they're liberal minded, it's, it's, it's extreme hypocrisy because they're all about choice as long as you make their choice. Right. But if you don't make their choice, you better watch out because, because there's rocks coming for you, you know? Right. So it's total hypocrisy. Free, actual, the most, the most liberal minded people are people that don't care what your choice is as long as it's not, you know, maiming someone or stealing their property or abusing them in some way. Okay. I mean, obviously like maligning them, but, but that is total freedom is that you say, it's say, I don't care what you do. You know, you do whatever you want. You like people say to me, you should vote. Oh yeah. I should. Oh yeah. Is that a commandment? Is it, what are you going to, what are you going to do? If I don't vote, you're going to punish me or something. I mean, you see what I'm saying? My friend, uh, my friend, a lawyer here in town that does work for me, he was, a, was in the Marines, and he, he says that he fought for my right 
to not support him fighting or something like that. It's very funny. It's it's very. I said that, sure. that I can I can get down with that. You know what I mean? That's that's my kind of freedom. Is that I don't care what you do. I don't have any expectations on you. And all I want is that no one harms you. And other than that, you do whatever you want. But no virtue signaling, no commanding people to do anything, and no shaming people that don't agree with your ideology. That's unacceptable. That's not freedom. No, you know, freedom isn't. is freedom is you do what you, what you want, and you don't have to answer to anyone. No one, no one should be shamed for for their uh, beliefs, or you know, and their preferences. Let's call it preferences, not beliefs, because beliefs are kind of like the thing that get the whole world in trouble. People, you know, drop atom bombs on people because of their beliefs. But preferences is more appropriate because you can have a preference for someone, you can vote for them, and you shouldn't have to be shamed about it when you do it. Absolutely. That's the American way. I mean, is to do your choice. That's, you know, and speak without hurting anyone, but be able to speak your opinions. It's very interesting what you just talked about is um, the virtue signaling, you know, the fake virtue signaling that most people do right now. Oh, I'm so upset, you know, um, Jane Fonda coming on, defund the police. You know, she says defund the police while she's sitting up there in the hill with her hourly private security going around. You know, she has no idea the impact. So this virtue signaling just to please people, it's a very Chinese concept, you know, that whole social um, conditioning and the pressure for everybody to think the same. So you made an excellent point in that the liberals are all about think and do whatever you want, you know, LGBTQ, you know, power to the people, everything, unless someone disagrees. And then it's like, you know, stone them, you know. Well, yeah. And let's explain to people what virtue signaling is. It's, it's saying, it's saying I'm more virtuous than you because I wear a dental shield in my own car and, and, (laughs) you know, and, and whatever, I'm more virtuous than you, but see, they were taught that because, because, to be more virtuous than someone, you have to have a rating system. So you have to have decided that this is more virtuous, this is average virtuous, this is less virtuous. So you have to have come up with this system. And then you begin shaming people that are less virtuous. But see, that's, that's the, the, the goal. If, if, if people watching this, if you really want to take your way of thinking to the next level, stop rating people. Because you were taught that the good people live up on the hill and they have, you know, wall-to-wall carpeting and Cadillacs and, and they drink alcohol and the bad people do drugs and live, you know, in a box and they're down here in the street and there's rats down there and the bad, they're the bad people. And the average people, they want to live up on the hill, but they can't afford it. See, you've, someone taught you all this mm-hmm. and you believe it and you feel comfortable having this rating system. And so if you want to take your thinking to the next level, stop rating people entirely. You can have preferences for your own life. You could say, I prefer to do this and I prefer to live over there and I prefer to, you know, have a, this kind of diet and this kind of situation for myself. Okay. I prefer that, but I don't get involved in saying that people that don't prefer the same thing as me are less than because nobody is less than, and also no one is better than. It's all something you've come up with in your mind that you've now decided that, that you're rating these things. And it gives people a lot of trouble. These people are very disturbed. People that are virtue signaling you, they're very disturbed people. So ultimately, don't worry about them because they're not living a, a, a easy uh, um, life that's in kind of flow with, with how things are going, you know, very, a very... They're not, they're not in a smooth situation. They're not that's very a bumpy, zen. <laughs> that's a bumpy road to go down. And you don't want to have any sort of anything but compassion for them. When they, when they shame you for not having a mask on when you're walking in a park, you say, oh, I forgot it. I'm so sorry. You know, I'm, I won't do it again. You know, I, I certainly hope that, you know, I don't end up in a pile of bodies at the morgue or something. So, I mean, you know, you can say it, it's not their fault. My store because of me. <laughs> my yeah. I mean, right. you know, it's exactly right. I'm just going from here to the Trump rally and I didn't think I'd need it. You know, you could say that to them. They get really upset. You know, then they're going to get really, really mad at you. So, Would so you then like you can take in a hat. I have a hat. For then you. You, you can say, I don't see why you're so mad. I'm just, you know, I'm just, just trying to get to the gun store. So, okay. But, the point is, anyway, we'll, we'll, you know, I'm sure we have to wrap up here, but, yes. but 
all this stuff has to do with our original point. You know, you, you're thinking, you know, you, you're thinking about things, all things money. You're thinking about, about investing. You're thinking about how to manage your wealth. You're thinking about these things. It's not about greed and fear and all the stuff you think it's about. Your thinking is, is you got to work on your thinking and you got to let go of your concepts and the things that you've been told. And you got to, you got to open your eyes and see what's going on. That's why I wrote the book and I hope everyone will check it out. You can get it on Amazon. Why gold? Why now by EB Tucker, you can get it on audible. I'll read you the whole book in less than five hours myself. It's very, very good too. It's, it's been in a really high quality studio that, that some major bands and people have recorded. And it's a very, it was a very fun project. You can read it on Kindle on your phone. You can read it in, in other countries. You can, you can, I made it so that anybody can get it. Okay. And you can get it, you can get it right now. And, and I hope that you have an, a fun time reading it and you feel like I took you on a, a journey and told you a story because that's, that's how it is. That's how it was written. Eb, this has been an amazing interview. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Yeah, thanks for having me. This has been great. Mr. Eb Tucker, precious metals expert, financial commentator, and the author of the new book, Why Gold, Why Now? For the Industry Experts Panel, I'm Michelle Holliday at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com.